Hey, this is Jack from Bombay Bicycle Club, and you're about to hear six mini documentaries about the band. We've kind of been involved ourselves with the program, kind of aiming to make it a bit different to just your average band doc. We were sort of very willing to even embarrass ourselves, um, listening back to the first interviews we ever did with Zane Lowe, which are quite frankly uh, terrible, dissecting our early demos with Hugh Stevens. Um, I've put together a 10 minute mix of all of our various influences. And then lastly, we've let our keyboard player and comedian Louis Bowes let him loose on our fans at Earl's Court to see what they have to say about us. And without further ado, here it is. So I hope you enjoy it. Chapter one, those early interviews. So check it out. Bombay Bicycle Club turned 10 years next year and they've earned themselves a Radio 1 documentary. And this is through great music. This is through great performances. This is through dedication to their craft. This is not through great interviews. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I've been roped in uh, to try and make sense of these media shy bunch. It's so media shy, didn't even show up today. <laughs> It was his mum's birthday, which shows where his priorities are. And we can we can accept that. That's a, that's a valid excuse. Uh, but we have Sarim, we have Jack, and we have Jamie from Bombay Bicycle Club. And this interview comes with a twist. I've been charged with the responsibility of going through your history and your records, one awful interview clip at a time. Before we start, guys, you know, are you are you and were you aware when you were doing interviews that it was as difficult, you know, for everybody and, as, and difficult for you, and that it wasn't something that was enjoyable, really? Absolutely. I mean, I remember emailing you personally after every <laughs> interview right. saying, I'm really sorry. Right. We're not actually like rude people. We, it was obvious to us, but it just didn't make, that didn't make it easier, you know. You know, we knew your music was special right from the very first song that we heard. And, and every album that you've released has been different and remarkable and excellent. But trying to get the information out of you about that hasn't always been easy. Let's go back to Hugh Stevens' first ever phone interview with you. Right, let's talk to Jack from Bombay Bicycle Club. Hello, Jack. Hello, Hugh. You are Zane Lowe's Album of the Week. Uh, I had the blues, but I shook them loose is the name of the of the brilliant debut album. It's a great t title. Can you tell us about the title? Who came up with it? Um, I think it was Q-Tip from A Tribe Called Quest. Wow, amazing. I didn't know that. Is it a sample from Q-Tip, is it? Yeah, it's one of his lyrics. Wow, is he a big influence on you and your music? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm a big fan, yeah. Did he go and see him at Glastonbury? No, he was, who was he clashing with? Someone big. Yeah. Neil Young. Oh, OK. Neil Young. I didn't see Q-Tip either, but I did see you play a momentous gig on the park stage. Oh, yeah. Um, it was beautiful, wasn't it? A sunny day. What day was it? Saturday? Yeah, Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, your head is in your hands right now. This was brilliant. It was a bit tiring playing three times yeah. and getting there on the Wednesday and having so I don't know. Wow. Oh, God. <laughs> wow, amazing. The enthusiasm just pouring off a young teenage Jack Steadman there. <laughs> it, it raises an interesting point, I think, that interview, because you were still at school when you released that record. Mm -hmm. And those last years, or certainly for me, of leaving school, school and getting ready to go into the wider world are full of mystery and unknown. You guys knew what you wanted to do. It doesn't make it any less awkward, though, does it? I just wish I had altered the tone of my voice slightly. If you'd be a little more perky, no well, one hey. <laughs> How much of that reticence to talk about yourself do you just chalk up to kind of youthful awkwardness? Because when you're that age, you know, you, you when you're around your friends and stuff, mm. and you're still in a, in a kind of, you know, confined education space, it's, you don't really walk around the playground going, hey, check it out, what's going on? I'm playing Glastonbury, <laughs> right? It's not what you do. No, I think if, if anything, you're constantly having to play it down yeah. because people are always taking the mickey out of you and still do. So even now, when I'm around my friends, I try not to talk about it at all. I think we decided very early on that we didn't want any media training. I want to talk to you about media training, but first, just before we let that 2009 interview with oh. Hugh Stevens go, I just wanted to play you something that we found which is actually off the record. It's not like us here at the BBC to play snippets of uh, post-interview dialogue, but this is in fact what was said between Hugh and the producer directly after that interview. <laughs> <laughs> Met that man. Mate, mate, that's <laughs> awful from him. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's unfair. 
<laughs> you asked for this. I didn't. This was. I just want to say, by the way, because I've been getting a bit of stick lately from people thinking I've come up with some pretty dodgy ideas. This was not my idea. This, this was my idea. This was Jamie's <laughs> idea. Um, media training. I, we we heard whispers that there was talk about you doing that. Did anyone ask you to do that? It's not something that bands often talk about, but I think it's a good point to address, given that you've you've survived this. We did have lunch with someone who was meant to be giving us media training, and then he got fired. <laughs> <laughs> what was uh, what was talked about at lunch? What do you remember taking, if anything, from that experience? Uh, it, that wasn't media training itself. It was just him saying that you know you can talk to some people about it, and there's people that specialise in it. Well, there was a sheet of paper with bullet points with things <laughs> like talk about your interests, try and be bubbly when you talk. And how did you make? How did that make you feel when you saw that list? To be honest, it just makes it worse. Yeah. I don't know. For me, things like people asking you, "How excited are you for so and so for such and such event?" It's you are excited about it, but not at that moment in time when you're on the phone to someone. But that's when the media training traditionally kicks in, I think. Yeah, and because it's, such a, it's a it becomes a, a reflex mm. when you see big pop stars doing it. They've always got a smile on their face. I guess we should have just been less stubborn about the whole thing and just realised that that is kind of part of it. But then we wouldn't be sitting here having this wonderful debrief. <laughs> and it brings us up to the next record, which, as you know, is one of my favourite albums that you guys have released, Flaws. I love that album. And finally, we got a chance to talk about that, and here's what happened. Good evening, gents. And lady, how are you guys feeling? Are you happy? Very happy. Really? Really good. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just rewind that and just say that? Well, I think that was uh, Seren's first ever debut. That, uh, that sounded like Ed, or was that me? That, that was, was you. you. Yeah. That was your speaking debut on Radio 1. Yeah. You oh, actually man. came to my rescue. Just, we're going to play that again. I want everyone just to remember the very awkward silence after Lady. Here we go. Good evening, gents. And Lady, how are you guys feeling? Are you happy? Very happy. Really, really good. Can we talk about this acoustic record? Yep. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, I thought, oh god. Once more with feeling. Once more with feeling. My producer never says anything. You just you just omitted groaning sounds of desperation from my producer. She's oh, eating cake. So, it's so laid back, the album that we, we have become as laid back. As the record sounds? Yeah. She's eating quiche. She's ruining her quiche. You know that, right? What kind of quiche is it? What kind of quiche is it? Uh, cheese, tomato, and broccoli. Cheese, tomato, and broccoli. Good quiche. Nice. Come on, that's not a quiche. I just ate a pint of prawns. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Jamie with the food save. <laughs> with the whole pint? Yeah. That's a bit greedy. Yeah, and the, I didn't want to share. <laughs> and therein lies the crux of Bombay Bicycle Club right there. Um, wow, I just did um. <laughs> I just did um. I, that's a, I, dude, I'm, I'm really struggling here at this interview. Why don't we listen to some music and then we'll come back and we'll start again. Yeah. Uh, this is Bombay Bicycle Club. And Ivy and Gold, the first recorded session. Trey, did you enjoy recording this in Made of Vale today? Yeah. Yeah? Was yeah, it, it was really good. Good, let's listen to it. We'll come back and catch up with <laughs> BBC on BBC in a second. Don't worry, listeners. They were always like this. I didn't think it was going to be that bad. You know what it was? I remember you saying after that interview, I think, when I saw you next, it's never address the group with us. You gotta, you gotta choose someone. Say, yeah, Seren, yeah, yeah. Seren, how did you feel about your drum part? And yeah. Everything? Did you just get nervous before interviews? Is that what it was? I think it was just an unnatural thing for us to talk about yourself. I'd be really interested to know, from your point of view of interviewing so many different people, what do what do other people say when you say how much you love their record? Thank like you very a much. Big pop star. Thank you very much. Hmm. I think we'd probably rather get hate <laughs> because what? then you can turn that into something positive. There's nothing you can do with the positivity. Just, <laughs> maybe that's just me. There were some dark times in North London, wasn't there? When you guys were crying. Do you ever look back? Because none, because none of you guys went to university, right? None of you obviously went to university. We went straight into the band, but going straight from school and being on the road and stuff—it's quite an unnatural life, isn't it? I'd say so. I, I think it stops you from growing up emotionally, personally. Mm. There's always someone looking after you in some way. But at the same time, since the age of 16 I suppose we and particularly Jack have kind of been responsible for our own destinies and it's not on anyone else when it comes to making music. I'm just worried now that we because I think deep down we were really grateful for all this you know support we were getting but it, might, it just it obviously never came across and we yeah. always just assumed that people would know that. Like I said right at the very start of this it's not really about the interviews it's about the records that you make and you know every single one including your latest to me has been an amazing achievement. And I know you don't like taking compliments, but just for once, I think you need to know that. The reason this documentary is happening, the reason why people love your band is because, you know, you guys are really, really good. 
Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, of course, the Bombay Bicycle Club documentary continues on, but needless to say, uh, that was a horrendous experience for all. <laughs> but very therapeutic. That was incredible. <laughs> Chapter two, the main collaborators. Are you going to call me Neil or Dad? Well, so, uh, we'll, well you'll see. Um, <laughs> this is Jamie and Jack from Bombay Bicycle Club. And for this part of the documentary, we've chosen three of our favourite, most important, rather, collaborators to interview ourselves. And first up, we're interviewing my dad, Neil McColl. Hello, Dad. Hello. <laughs> Hi, son. <laughs> yeah. He's probably worked with us, or rather been around <laughs> longer <laughs> than anyone else that we've worked with. Uh, would you like to tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? Uh, I'm a musician, I variously played with uh, David Gray, Marianne Faithful, David Gilmour from Pink Floyd, lots of others. And of course your parents, my grandparents, are very famous, very folk, famous folk musicians. My grandfather, your dad, Ewan McColl, wrote a very famous song called The First Time Ever I Saw Your Face. The first time ever I saw your face. Which you may well have heard being covered on The X Factor before. The first bit of advice I ever remember giving you was um, when you came home from school one day and said, I've met this guy at school who writes songs and I, I want your opinion as to whether I should work with him or not. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, no, play me something. And you brought home this CDR, which Jack had made, which was about an hour in length, one piece of music from beginning to end. <laughs> And it was a kind of a lot of electronica interspersed with bits of songs and some really great ideas for songs, actually. Some of which went on our first album, I think. Yeah, probably. And one in particular which didn't, I seem to remember. Well, look, it's brilliant. City Lights. City Lights. Mm. Which was fantastic. Classic. City Lights, the way Glowing as night takes over the Jack as well grew up with a dad that, although he wasn't a musician, he was very passionate about music. Definitely just listening to the records that I found in his cupboard and that probably explains my prog rock phase, age 15, <laughs> <laughs> and why I handed a CD of an hour long song to Neil. <laughs> <laughs> so my first bit of advice was yes you know you've got to work with this guy and I, a question that I'm going to ask Jim Abyss later as well is how were we in the studio <laughs> the first time you worked with us when we were 15 I think at the time you were fine you could all play and there were flaws in the band, you know, you were just doing, you were doing it for the first time, the same there would be with anybody. Siren's bass drum work needs work, you know, Jack hasn't got the stamina for singing for that long. Guitar sounds could be better than they are, but you learn that stuff as you go along. It's not something you can necessarily be taught, you have to feel it for yourself. With every band, every act that gets signed, there has, there's, there's an element of natural talent. There's also a fantastic amount of luck. And I think you've had that as well. This is Jamie and Jack, and we're about to Skype with Jim Abyss. 
He produced our first and third albums and is one of our most influential collaborators because he's one of the few people that has worked with us from pretty much the start. As far as I can remember, it was I think it was my dad that passed on our very first demos to you because you'd worked together before. Well, actually, he first of all rang me and said that you were in a band and would I like to come and see them? And the show was like the next the next week. And I came down to a little bar in Islington and I, and I loved the show and I asked if I could hear what you'd done so far. Can you remember your first impressions of the demos? What I first thought was that there was a maturity in the way that the songs were structured and, and the chords. And that's what really sparked my interest initially. And can you remember what it was like meeting us for the first time? You were, I think, very, very shy. I guess the scenario was intimidating because you were at school and you've never been in the studio before and it was really difficult to get opinions from you. The thing I would absolutely credit you with is that you were fast learners and what we actually ended up with, I still think, stands up as a really good version of where you were at that point in your lives. Yeah. I think it's very important for people to be brave enough to go, well, that's where we were. I think even now we kind of, in our heads, have this idea of you being <laughs> like a safety net where we can play stuff to and we'll know that you'll give us an, an honest response. Well, that's, that's, that's lovely to hear and I, I hope that's always the case because I'll always be around if you, if you need any kind of help because you know, we're, well, we're friends now and <laughs> we have a history, so I, I hope that continues. Me too. We're going to play some romantic, emotional music in the, in the background <laughs> oh, for that bit. It was, was, was a little bit, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, this is Jack, and I'm here with Lucy Rose. Do you want to paint the scene of how we met? I think I was just stalking you guys as a band. There's a, a gig down the road from my house that I saw that you guys were playing, and I went down and just went over to you afterwards, and I started chatting, yeah. telling you how much I love all of your music, and then just hard-plugged my music at you. Please listen to my music. And actually, and you did, did, which was I went onto your MySpace page. Classic. And listened to a song called what was the one? Traveling I song. Traveling song. Yeah. I legally ripped it from MySpace and took the liberty of remixing it straight away. It was the was biggest it. thing that ever happened to oh. me. I was like, couldn't believe it. <laughs> timing was such that we were sort of just about to start doing our more acoustic stuff and mm -hmm. we had this concert where we were singing a lot of covers and a lot of old folk songs I think and things with harmonies and I I think I just sent you a message saying would you be up for singing with us? I sort of just turned up to Union Chapel, met you once mm -hmm. and trying to introduce myself to the rest of the band who I was in awe of and trying to be cool and I probably failed miserably practiced a couple songs there and then and then suddenly I was on stage with you singing so it was pretty bizarre for me but it was very relaxed like it floors was. was the first thing you asked me to come and sing on and record and that was just in your bedroom and I remember going in you had like your single bed on one side your record player and then all your vinyls and then a tiny desk with your computer and one microphone and we recorded something in half an hour, a song I never heard, and you made me sing it once or twice, maximum. You're like, yeah, I've got it, that's great. It's just a demo or something, I don't know. And then suddenly that version that was recorded there was on the album Floors. Yeah. And suddenly I was could hear my voice on Radio 1 for the first time. Take your second plan. 
begin to understand Life of a selfless man Cause out of all the flaws I've stumbled on Is a hardest It's the hardest one to focus on. I think the funny thing is, is as time went on, you know, we had more of a professional relationship. I think I always tried to recreate that relaxed environment. Your vocals being added to the sound was almost a turning point in our sort of career where we took a new path almost sonically and added textures and... As much as you say that for you, it was for me completely life-changing as well, being on records and somebody having faith in you as a musician and you guys were the first people to do that. There was definitely times when we talked in depth about me joining in some way. Me and Lucy used to always talk about it. The um, ultimate dream. I actually wanted that. For some reason it wasn't destined to be, but at the same time, you know, these were Bombay Bicycle Club songs, they weren't my songs. I feel like I need to cry. <laughs> I'm gonna go home and cry now. Need a drink. Now, apparently we can only ever make an album once we're 90 yeah. and have amazing stories to tell. It'll be one of those old folk albums, but we're not at the right age for it. <laughs> That's what Jack tells me anyway. We're kind of in the in-between stage right now where we're neither like looking forward or looking back. And I want to wait till we're looking back. Yeah, this is his plan. I'm free whenever, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll just wait. <laughs> This is Jamie from Bombay Bison Club and you are listening to six short stories about our bands. Still to come, the story of our Earl's Court gig and Louis the keyboard player is let loose on the fans. Good Lord. Chapter 3. Musical Influences uh... Hey, this is Jack from Bombay Bicycle Club, and for the next 10 minutes, you're going to hear a mix that I've put together of our favorite and most influential pieces of music. And if you want the track listing, it'll be online at bbc.co.uk slash radio one slash stories. When we went on tour, there was one night where, like, the crowd like invaded the stage, and we had to finish the set earlier. They manage every time to step on your lead and unplug you, and then you can't see anyone else in the band because there are too many people on stage, and you end up just saying, "Okay." Go mad! Yeah. 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 Yeah.
it strikes me as maybe that scene could do a little with a little bit of artistic kind of traffic coming in and out of it to just uh, keep it flowing because a, a, a music that doesn't change or isn't open to bastardization or hybridization will it will eventually die I truly believe that there is going to be a proper resurgence interest in, in folk music That you go catching dreams from the clouds. The city sounds burn your soul, turn your head to the cries of loneliness in the night. Just like a fly. When it's caught, the spider soon takes its prey, spins a dance round your heart. Yet be your beauty and age, your pleasure pleasing my mind, your heart will shatter and fall. Step on pavement, soul, cast a glance. That the young girls are making their way The passing image of you Reflects the pain to my heart And disappears in a cry Sampling is a bit like, uh, to compare it with another art form, is a bit like uh, photo collage.
Hey, this is Jack, and you're listening to six short stories about our band Bombay Bicycle Club on BBC Radio One. Chapter Four: Anatomy of a Track. This is Hugh Stevens, and I've been a big fan of Bombay Bicycle Club、uh, since I first heard them. It was the Young and Lost Singles Club, which comes to an end in 2015. Who put out their first single, which was a version of Evening Morning, and I just fell for them completely. Rather than make one hour-long documentary about the band, we're making six short documentaries. And for my part in this epic, I've been given a studio, Bombay Bicycle Club themselves, and their laptop. And we're going to spend the next few minutes finding out how they go about writing a track. Sir and Jamie, Jack and Ed, it's always lovely to see Bombay Bicycle Club. And how exciting! Six mini docs in one. Pretty special.、Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. So. First up, we're gonna listen to some demos. So, what are we gonna listen to, Jack? The first one is Shuffle, which is kind of the first time that this way of writing songs started. A song starting out in kind of an ambiguous way, where it could be an electronic piece of music or it could be translated into a Bombay Bicycle Club song. Wow! And we have sort of every version here, so that you sort of get an idea of the stages it goes through before being. Printed on the record. The interesting thing is that Jack has always made electronic music as long as I've known him. But I, I guess Shuffle and maybe always like this earlier on was the first time that his interest in that had found its way into the band's music. So what's this and, version we're well, going to hear? This is the first demo that I sent the guys of Shuffle, and just while you're listening to it, imagine them scratching their heads and <laughs> saying, "What on earth <laughs> is Jack thinking? What, what does he think he's doing?" <laughs> First thing is the piano. So, sir, when you hear that for the first time, what do you think? When Jack first sent this to us, I, I remember just really, really not being very keen on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, But it's got drums. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that was that was the good bit. But,、um, I mean, like Jack said, it's just, just so different to anything we've done before. Just a bit too, I don't know, a bit too merry for my liking, I suppose. <laughs> okay, He's a, you've got a dark heart. I thought Jack had lost his mind. <laughs> Jamie was the only one that was really into it and just pushed for this to be made into a proper song. Okay, let's carry on with hearing it. How could you be doubters, Bombay Bicycle Club? I mean, that's so weird for for, for all the Bombay fans listening because they used to go mad to that live now. So to hear it in that embryonic state, it's amazing. Yeah, it's quite silly. It's, it's one of our biggest songs. I guess it shows that we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> <really> . <laughs> the, so the next bit is after the encouragement from Jamie, I went into a proper studio with guitars and drums, and that's、right. kind of the next step is to try and add. Acoustic instruments to it, so that it would make sense in the context of the band. So this is the、um, second this, version. This round two, yeah. Same chorus,、mm. but you know Ed gets to play the bass and Serena gets to play the drums and Jamie gets to play the guitar and everyone's happy. <laughs> That sounds so loose and、um, frail compared to the version on the album, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. So have you got the next version for us, Jack? Yeah. This is the version that we did with Ben Allen. We did some pre-production with him、um, with the song, and I think this song was pretty much the same chords the whole way through the song. And he came in and was like, "Let's change the chords. This one is is so different and so much more like a kind of pop song, I think."
the good thing about Ben was that he kind of forced you to make this very loop-based electronic song into a real piece of songwriting. Yeah. And a simple thing as just changing the bass line and making the chords a bit more melancholy and it just being less of a straight, kind of repetitive dance track. So back into the Bombay Bicycle Club laptop. What's next, Jack? This is the opening track from our new record, uh, Overdone. So we're going to play you the original Straight away, this is the demo taken from the sample. Uh, entitled Hindustan Ye West. Yeah, I okay. think that's one of the best song titles that Jack's ever come up with. <laughs> It's a shame it's not called that on the album. Yeah, so you changed it to Overdone. So, Jack, I know you've got um, a big interest in Bhangra and in Bollywood music, and Bombay Bicycle Club have played in India a couple of times now, haven't you? Is that yep. where the sample came from? Did you pick it up on your travels? That was, yeah, a record picked up in Bombay. Uh, it's called Apnea Pyar Kasapne. It was just those strings. As, you know, as soon as I heard that, I thought that if I was to revisit that song, I would have added some fat hip hop drums on it. Right. So I did. Yeah, wow, that sounds incredible. <laughs> so again, it has absolutely no relevance to Bombay Bicycle Club, but the fun part is that sort of translation process. Yeah. And this is the first kind of Bombay demo. Sounds so, so good. It's quite triumphant, I think, mm. the sound of those strings. A sample often can just be the springboard, and that's what I like about sampling. Is it just inspires you to, to write something alongside it, and hopefully when you take away the sample, you've still got an interesting sound. Have there been any other record shop trips finding interesting samples in other countries that we might hear on future albums that you can give us a glimpse into? Uh, South American kind of cumbia and samba and that kind of th those rhythms that are quite foreign to our local music scene. Trying to incorporate that I think would be incredibly interesting. Yeah, nice. So that was overdone, um, and we're in the uh, Bombay vaults. What are we going to hear next? Uh, we're going to go to a song called Home By Now, written on a tour bus, on an iPhone app. Um, and I've actually found that original little snippet from the iPhone. Uh, so this is the... Entitled Damn That Bus Cold. Um, the bus was really cold. <laughs> this was also, the, I think this was the very, very first demo of any song for this album as well. Yeah. That is the, the piano sound from Home By Now. Wow. Royalty free. But that was done on your phone. It sounds so good. Kept the piano and, the, and that melody. And that's kind of how the song started. But that's a little sketch of it. Actually, in both examples of Home By Now and Shuffle, the kind of semi-mumbling does actually lead to lyrics sometimes in quite a nice way. I always think that you know, maybe that does mean something. And then you, when you're writing lyrics, you know, in a similar way that you're sampling the music, you're also 
taking a little sample from those initial words. Jack might disagree, but I think what has become most difficult from his perspective is, is trying to write lyrics to, to songs that have had mumbling on them for a year. You get used to like the phrasing and the number of syllables, and then it suddenly becomes quite difficult to imagine the song in any other way. That's probably where we disagreed most over this album. I think there's something that is really hard to recapture about a first performance, and it's something that you can go round and round in the studio about when you're in a big proper studio, like, oh, how do we get it to sound like the crappy demo? And then in the end, you just sort of keep it because that's what is magic about the song, and I think that's the case with this one. And you know, and back and come home. And you know, and you know, and back and come home. And you know, such a beautiful song and to hear it from you know that iPhone on the tour bus to the finished version it's amazing isn't it so good I think I've got to stop have I okay well it was fascinating I loved it thank you (laughs) (laughs) yeah beautiful thanks guys lovely to see you Chapter 5, Louis Bit. Hi, I'm Louis. I've been working for the band since 2009 when I managed to convince a slightly inebriated Ed Nash to let me tune guitars for them. Since then, I've been around the world with them, obnoxiously farting my way through the cramped conditions that you live in when 12 of you sleep in bunk beds on a bus. So, it's fair to say, I know them all pretty well. But what I'd like to talk about isn't the band, it's their fans. I'm Charlie Seymour. I sort of fell in love with them from them playing at Ivan Gold. Just sort of pretty much not listened to anyone else but them since. I'm Josh and I'm from Kent. I heard them a while ago, carried on listening when they released new albums. I'm Imogen, I'm from Eastbourne and I'm 20. I think I was in college and a friend recommended them to me. I'd never heard of them before but obviously their name was quite catchy to begin with. Over five years, in the crowds and over the internet, I've seen the fans grow up. The people who I would see post OMGs and I Can't Evens and now posting about Marxist theories and Attenborough documentaries. Monkey Mind turned to improving their world. But when I stopped painting my nails black, I stopped buying my Chemical Romance tickets. These guys are still coming to shows. I'm convinced that herein lies the reason for Bombay's success. The fans aren't a fan of a genre, a scene or a fad. They're fans of the songs. And it's the fans who've kept the band in check. I personally think twice before posting ban-related items online for fear of incurring the wrath of the razor-sharp wit of the online community. I'm positive that without them, egos within the band would have been allowed to flourish freely, as they would if you played to adoring fans every night. As it is, Jamie can't even get dropped off at a DJ set by his nan without getting the piss taken out of him. That's not to say they're not nice too, There's a guy called Tyler who for years has ripped pretty much every Bombay concert that's streamed online or on television and put it on YouTube. I've only met him briefly, but I know his name well. And I know his name well because I've watched every show of ours that he's posted, well, before they're taken down. They're an essential part of improving every element of the live show. So here's your shout out. Thanks, Tyler. 
remember meeting someone called Conan backstage at a Canadian gig. I was a little confused as to why he was there, but he explained that he had been emailing constantly saying how much he wanted to come to the show, even though he was underage. He must have been very convincing, because he had been snuck in by management and allowed to wait in the production office until doors opened. Conan's now 20, and his band Little India are doing very well in Canada. Hey, keep walking around. Last summer, they toured around the country, and who tour managed them? A Bombay fan from York called Ian. How did Ian and Conan meet, nearly 5,000 miles apart? They met through the Bombay online community. So I've never been part of a community that's like as close-knit as we are. We just all sort of chat on there, we talk about Bombay, make funny pictures of them and stuff. There are these ones called the McCollars, uh, who love Jamie, the guitarist. There are also the Stead Bombs, uh, who love Jack and they write fan fiction. Now, I interviewed a lot of these guys for this documentary, but instead of letting them speak for themselves, I had them answer stupid questions like which band member they would bring home to meet the parents. Bombay fans being as lovely as they are, they humoured me. What I should have had them talk about was the fan community itself, because it's a hell of a community. Over the years, ignoring the healthy Facebook group and constant tweeting, there has been a Tumblr dedicated to Jamie McCall as Jesus, one dedicated to Ed's snappy wardrobe, and even one called Stead Bombs, a platform to showcase some excellent piss-take fanfiction. Spoiler alert, Jack is heartbroken because Ed only has eyes for Saren. Do the band like all of their fans? No, of course not. Any band that says they do are lying. The hammered ones that invade their personal space, the ones that ask for photos while they're eating, the ones that complain endlessly about the lack of early material in their sets, they are not appreciated. But having played hundreds of shows to tens of thousands of fans, I can tell you that the vast, vast majority are appreciated. And it looks like they appreciate each other too, be it online, at gigs, or at bicycle meetups. It seems that the lack of scene, of binding genre, has brought longevity to both the band and their followers. Traditionally, it's the fan who feels pride at a band's progress. But in this case, I think the band can be proud of their fans. I love that they just change it up each time. So each album is different. It's quite nice having that diversity, but people remain fans of them. A few times after gigs, and they've sometimes known my name, which is quite nice. And they recognise your work on Twitter and stuff, so... There's just something about them that no other band has, I think. They're, they're always changing, so that you, know, you can never get bored of them. This is Jamie from Bombay Bicycle Club and this is Six Stories of Bombay Bicycle Club on BBC Radio 1. The final chapter, The Road to Earl's Court. Hey, I'm Jack. Hello, this is Ed. Jack. Too loud. Jack, Jack, First hey. time in our lives we've ever spoken to Jack, you. Jack, Jack. Is that the word you meant? We are here at John Henry's in Caledonian Road in London doing some yeah. rehearsing. Just, uh, it's a bit um, clanky. Clanky. Plunky, plunky, clanky. Well, well, if you want me to be less plinky, I will plink less. We leave for Iceland on, in fact, we leave for Iceland tomorrow. So we spend two days in Iceland, then we go around Europe, then to South Africa, and then straight into the UK tour, which we finish off in Earl's Court. Jason, you're fired. <laughs> we have 19 guitars on this tour. I believe that's... Uh, like our, our crew are genuinely amazed that we have that many guitars and we, we're using them all. I don't think anyone else uses more than four or five. Bongos? Oh, yeah. Got a huge crew, lots of lights, 
um, oui. set pieces, projections. Not wanting to sound too cheesy, it's just going to be the, like a really nice way to end the year. But we're doing it in London, in a venue that its final day is coinciding with ours, you know. And we're just about to announce that it's going to be the final show ever at Earl's Court. So, you, you know, you couldn't really pick a more perfect way to finish your touring cycle. Back to the yeah, box, down, just do that line and then just straight to there, yeah. and then you repeat this little bit with the dots. And then the ripping solo. Ripping solo. I think the monotony of rehearsing is what kind of drives bands to try something different with their songs, you know, once they've been playing them for years. Otherwise, we, you know, our songs wouldn't change at all live. Chasing the night to me. What's up? Yep, 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 yep. Hey, this is Jack, and I'm backstage at Earl's Court on Saturday the 13th of December at approximately 2 p.m. We got here at around 10, and actually I walked in and thought, oh, it's not that big, actually. Maybe it's the same size as Alexandra Palace, but I think that'll change when I get on stage. <laughs> I've just had my lunch, and we're about to go have a little celebratory fireworks display before we start our sound check. <laughs> Hey, this is Ed at Earl's Court. We've got video walls, we've got fireworks, and actually we have a special guest who's just turned up, and he's got more guitar techs and more guitars than we have, so we'll see what happens with that. Uh, we didn't want to say before, but now we can reveal that our special guest is David Gilmore of Pink Floyd, and the reason for that is the first gig that was ever held at Earl's Court was a Pink Floyd show back in 1973, and this is the last show we'll ever do here, so we got him to come and play Wish You Were Here. I'm more nervous about that than the gig itself. I'm a huge fan of his. It's Jamie. The mood is expectant, mixed with angry manager standing in the background because we're running behind schedule. Right, let's go pyro crazy. I am in the arena. It's very noisy. It's, it's like being on a building site, you could say. And Ed is just coming over. It looks a lot bigger when it's dark. <laughs> it's having a bit of a cry now. Hello, I'm Ray Morris, here at Earl's Court with Lucy Rose. Yo, hi. <laughs> we're here uh, just about a sound check for tonight's show. Yeah, well, we actually didn't think we were going to be playing, but in true Bombay fashion, they uh, kept us on our toes and a couple days ago sent us both the text saying, do we want to come and sing here? And obviously, that's a complete honour, so we're both very excited. I think we are about to see some practice fireworks. Oh, yes! We're off. There we go. <laughs> this is David Gilmore of Pink Floyd, and um, I'm here at Earl's Court to uh, sit in with the Bombay Bicycle Club for a couple of songs. It's great, and um, you know, we've played here, I've played here about close to 30 times, I think, in a long career. I haven't been here for 20 years, but um, yeah, it's terrific to be invited to make a little guest appearance on, the, on its last night before they demolish the fourth place. Jamie, the guitar player, is, um, is the son of some friends of mine, so I've known him, I think I gave him his very first guitar a good few years ago. So, and so they very nicely asked me to sit in with them for a couple of tracks. I, I, you know, I like audiences. Whatever they are is, is fine. Not sure that they need to see an old age pensioner up there with their favorite band, but you know, it's cool. This is Ed, it's 20 to six. I just had a nap on the floor in our dressing room and I'm gonna eat dinner. Quite a productive afternoon. It, it, it's a bit weird, everyone's just trying to kill time and get there without, you know, freaking out. So I'm still half asleep. Hello, I'm Seren, uh, the drama in Bombay Bicycle Club. I think the doors are just about to open. I think obviously we're all a little bit nervous, but um, but at the same time, you know, we don't want to freak ourselves out. Hello, I'm Louis. I'll just talk you briefly through our rider. Uh, we have uh, 24 room temperature, 
uh, bottles of uh, Belu water. Uh, and then we have two bottles of red wine, uh, some beer, some Coca-Cola, and as a treat, because today's an especially big show, Earl's Court and all, we have some Haribo Tang Fastics. There's a gig about to start! There's a gig about to start! <laughs> Let's go. Yo, yo, I'm on the way to the stage. Uh, Seren? Where the hell is Seren? Where, where is Seren? Uh, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Seren? Are you ready? Yeah, we're going. We've just come off stage. It was um, fairly emotional. I could barely remember any of it, to be honest, but um, I'm sure I'm going to hear all about it for the rest of the evening. 2014 has been by far the busiest year we've ever had, and we've had some pretty busy years in the past. We had a number one album at the beginning of the year, which kind of hasn't sunk in yet. I'm sure, you know, when I'm 40 or something like that, I'll finally realize what that means. We're in a privileged position where every time we play a new show on a new tour, it's a step up. The thing you fear is when it starts sort of going back down the hill, um, which, I don't know, happens to a lot of people. I feel like we sort of worked our way up and then we did Ali Pali a few years ago and now it's Earl's Court. There's always just that moment where you're like, I can't believe that this is happening. Take care of yourself, we'll see you soon, thank you so much. What an absolutely inspirational act. Truly the band of our generation. That was Bombay Bicycle Club, a documentary as told by all six of them on BBC Radio 1. I'm up next as Phil Taggart.